Good morning, and welcome to the January 2023 board meeting of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, or the MHRA, as we prefer to call ourselves. My name is Stephen Lightfoot, and I'm the chair of the board, and my role today is to lead us through the agenda. Now, for those of you who've not attended one of our meetings before, I must start by reminding everyone that this is a board meeting held in public, and it is not a public meeting. So that means that the board will conduct its business without any contribution from members of the public or anybody who's watching today. But it's also, and it's also important to explain that the purpose of the live streaming is one of transparency rather than engagement, because there are many other opportunities for people to be engaged in the work of the agency, and we'll do that through the appropriate routes. It's also important to explain that the board is responsible for agreeing the strategic direction of the agency, maintaining high standards of corporate governance, and scrutinizing the performance of the agency. And it's really important to say that the board is not responsible for any individual regulatory decisions. And that's because individual regulatory decisions on specific medicines or medical devices are made by ministers in the Department of Health and Social Care on the recommendation of MHRA officials who themselves are independent civil servants. With the also the additional independent advice from our expert advisory committees, such as the Commission on Human Medicines. Now, as far as today's meeting is concerned, I also need to make you aware that we'll be recording the meeting so that we can publish the video on our website, as we have done for the last two and a half years for every meeting that we've held in public, to provide the opportunity for as many people as possible to observe what the board does. I think on that note, I'm pleased to say, <clears throat> excuse me, that 128 people have registered to observe our meeting live today with 74 members of the public or representatives of patient groups. We've got 41 uh, members representing industry, two journalists and 11 members of staff. So a very warm welcome to each and every one of you and thank you for joining us. Now with introductions in mind, <clears throat> I'd like to go around the room and ask my colleagues to introduce themselves so the audience know who we all are. So please use your microphones while you do that. So June, let's start with you. Good morning, everyone. I'm June Rain, and I'm the CEO here at the MHRA. Morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Bosworth. I'm Director of Communications and Engagement for the MHRA. Good morning, everyone. I am John Taylor, uh, Interim CF or Chief Financial Officer for MHRA. <clears throat> morning, everyone. I'm Raj Long, uh, Non-Executive Director on the MHRA Board. Morning, everyone. My name is Alison Cave. I'm Chief Safety Officer at MHRA. Uh, morning, I'm Graham Cooker, Non-Executive Director. I'm Natalie Richards, Head of the Executive Office. Good morning. I'm Haider Hussain, uh, Non-Executive Director. Good morning. I'm Mark Bailey, the Chief Science and Innovation Officer. Good morning. My name is Mandy Calvert. I'm a Non-Exec Director. Good morning, I'm Glenn Wells, Chief Partnerships Officer at the MHRA. Good morning, I'm Mercy Jessing, I'm Non-Executive Director. Good morning, I'm Laura Squire, Chief Officer for Healthcare Quality and Access in the MHRA. Uh, good morning, Paul Goldsmith, Non-Executive Director. Good morning, Carly McGurry, Director of Governance at MHRA. Thank you, colleagues, for those introductions. We're also aware that uh, there's two or three colleagues who've been caught up with the transport delays today, so there may be some additional members uh, able to join us before the end of the meeting. So um, we should all have access to the board pack of papers uh, for today's meeting. I'll use the page numbers uh, in that pack to keep us all on track. Um, I'll also assume that everybody's read the papers um, so that we can spend most of our time on discussion rather than presentation. Now, although this is not a public meeting, uh, we will provide an opportunity for members of the public to ask the board any questions about the items on the agenda uh, at the end in the final public Q&A session. Uh, and this can be done using the chat function. However, members of the public should be aware that the board here in the room today cannot see any of the comments on the chat function. Uh, and they're only used specifically for the communication and events team to be able to monitor uh, the comments that are being made to identify questions that should be asked at the end. So if you want to ask a question that's related to today's agenda, then please use the chat function. If you want to ask another question that is not related to today's agenda, then please do not use the chat function and please direct your inquiry to our customer experience center instead. 
Similarly, I'd also ask members of the public and uh, viewers not to make any personal or abusive comments in the chat function, as you will not get a response and you may be removed from the meeting, as we do not tolerate any form of abuse or harassment directed towards our staff or board members here at the MHRA. So that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Can I just check that that's all clear with everybody? Okay, thank you very much. That being the case then, let's move straight on into the agenda. Um, now we have formal apologies from Michael Whitehouse, a non-executive director and chair of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. Uh, we've got apologies from Alison Strath, the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer in Scotland, Greg Chalmers, the head of the Chief Medical Officer's Policy Division in Scotland, and also Cathy Harrison, the Chief uh, Pharmaceutical Officer in Northern Ireland. So if we just move on to page number three and look at the declarations of interest, can I just ask board members if there are any new declarations that have already not been declared? So I'm not seeing anybody raising any points there. So on that basis, can I assume that the register is accurate? Okay, having reviewed that register, I've concluded that there's no reason to ask, ask anybody to step out of the meeting for any of the items. And I'm therefore proposing that no further mitigations are required. Can I just check everyone's content with that? Thank you. Okay, so if we then move on to page number seven and we look at the minutes of the last meeting, can first of all I just check that they're an accurate record from everyone's recollection? I'm seeing nods around the table, no further comments to make. Okay, on that basis, I'd like to propose that we approve the minutes as an accurate record of the last meeting and change them from draft to final. Everybody content with that? Nods around the table, so. Natalie, we can record in the this minutes that uh, those minutes were approved as an accurate record. If we then just move on to page number 14 uh, and look at the actions from the last meeting, um, quite specifically identified the items in red that are due today um, for, uh, for completion. So I see that item number 43, uh, a revised assurance and governance framework, uh, is actually on the agenda today. So we'll cover that at that particular point. I also note that items number 83, number 85 and number 87 have all been completed. Can I just check everyone is content with that? Again, nods around the table. Uh, and that leaves item number 86, which is about a work program for the Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee and a conversation with each of the chief officers. Mandy, as the chair of that committee, can I just ask uh, how, how are you making progress on that? Uh, yes, that's a work in progress. So the meetings with the chief officers are in progress at the moment, and we're developing a work programme to follow on from the board um, board agendas. So okay. that should be available for the next meeting. Perfect. Okay, that's great. So I think we'll be able to hopefully then close that at that next meeting then if that works. So there are all the matters that were due today on the formal actions. Can I just check if there are any other matters arising from the last meeting that have not already been covered? No comments? Okay. Right, okay, well, let's move straight on then. So swiftly move to page number 16, uh, which is the Chief Executive's report, and what are the most important activities and priorities uh, from the CEO's point of view? June, over to you. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, board colleagues will see from the report that it's been a very busy couple of months, and uh, I know colleagues will have read the report, so perhaps I could just offer one or two highlights, um, particularly uh, important for us. Our focus on healthcare access and uh, delivery remains absolutely central, particularly enabling innovation. And innovation for us means not only accelerating access to new drugs like the prostate treatment you see here, but also some of the work to enable access longer term. And I'd like to highlight the work paving the way for software and AI, which is now being funded by the Regulators Pioneer Fund. And that's looking longer term, but extremely important as we seek to make this new technology available to the healthcare service and to patients. So that's grant funded work. And I'd also like to highlight some of the other areas when more than one organization is involved, such as the cannabis medicines, where both we and the Home Office are involved to actually make that pathway very much clearer. So access has a number of dimensions and colleagues on the board will see the amount of work that's done to uh, secure this for patients and for healthcare. Science research and innovation, of course, enables all of this, particularly our laboratory science that goes on at South Mims and uh, is of world 
uh, standards. So two years on from the launch of the innovative licensing and access pathway, colleagues will see that we're learning from those two years of experience in conjunction with our partners at the health technology assessment and bringing in views from the NHS. So a lot of innovation passports are now out there and the growing number of target development profiles, which help to remove uncertainties from the access pathway. I think it would be important also to mention some of the work to set standards, such as for cell-based therapies, and clearly the board last year visited the stem cell unit, the bank there, which is again the biggest in the world, so we're providing a lot of important opportunities, not just for research, but for access. Turning then to patient safety, always our top priority, and the announcement in December of new restrictions for sodium valproate, over the coming months uh, being put into clinical practice in the light of emerging evidence. And some of that evidence is really uh, cutting edge science on particularly transgenerational effects. So new restrictions coming through to enable safe use of that important medicine. I'll turn briefly to dynamic organization and the work that the ODRC committee is overseeing, looking at service transformation. And that's growing now as we see successes in the area of established medicines. But last but not least, none of this would happen without our staff who've been working really without uh, hesitation to deliver on the important agenda of our one agency. So a huge thank you to our staff whose efforts and commitment are not in question as you see this report, but happy to take questions now. Great, well, thank you very much, June. I think that's a, a really comprehensive report. So thank you very much to you, but also more importantly, thank you to everyone in the agency for all the fantastic work that has been done on a day-to-day -day basis. So appreciate that. So colleagues, uh, can I just ask if there are any specific questions for June? Mercy. Um, I've got um, two. One is just a point of clarification on 2.7, which is a product um, information things. Um, so that sounds really good, kind of working together to look at um, product information. Did that include discussions on the patient information leaflets? Well, thank you. Can you show? It certainly did. It yes. certainly included that. And we see the, the leaflet that companies medicines as a critical opportunity to ensure people get the benefit and, and the risk is minimised. One of the Brexit freedoms, you might call it, enables us to rethink the kind of information that helps individual patients and healthcare professionals make those judgments. So that piece of work is, is really cent central. And I hope the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee will get quite involved as it moves forward. Thank you, June. And you had a second question? Yeah, there, if, if that's okay. Um, the sodium valparate risk minimization kind of work as well. Um, I'm just thinking, um, how, how do we find evidence of harm? Um, and what do you think the NA NHS can do, um, you know, to, to help with this as well, to, to reduce that harm um, out there, there too, because obviously it's still concerning that we're, we're trying to tackle this. I couldn't agree more, Chair. It's still very concerning that the information and the advice that has been given over quite some time isn't fully embedded in clinical practice. So the two parts really of, of your question, Mercy, first of all, how do we gather evidence? Absolutely, day by day, any new information that becomes available. Also, by encouraging studies and demanding studies to be done. The uh, work on the transgenerational effects is a good example where we don't just look at uh, particular kinds of evidence from reports of harm, but we seek to stimulate the key study that will target understanding that harm. And secondly, your point about our work with the NHS. The Commission on Human Medicines has a broad uh, membership of its implementation group, really to understand the perspectives of the healthcare professionals who are doing an extraordinarily demanding job, keeping people with epilepsy and bipolar disorder safe on their medicines, but engaging with that community on the practicalities of the new measures, vitally important. And Chair, I think probably we might, if we want to talk in more detail, turn to our Chief Safety Officer. I'll pause just there. Okay. Alison, as Chief Safety Officer, do you want to make any additional comments? Um, I suppose I would just highlight that um, in, in conjunction with the launch of the previous risk minimisation measures in 2018, we, um, in conjunction with NHS Digital, put in place an anti-epileptic in pregnancy register. And that, was, that has been very helpful in allowing us to understand 
the trends in prescribing, uh, the trends in patients being switched from, val from valparate before they become pregnant, and also the trends in exposures during pregnancies. And it's this data um, in, in, in the context of continuing exposure during pregnancy, but also continuing high levels of prescribing in women of childbearing age, which has prompted additional measures to try and minimize further the risk from sodium valparate. So I think that in terms of understanding the impact of previous measures, these sorts of tools really help us understand whether those measures are actually delivering the impact that we had hoped. Okay. Could I, could I maybe suggest, Mercy, that maybe your committee uh, reviews this at an appropriate point when there's been time to actually embed some of the, the new measures, just to understand the impact that they're having? I think that's a really good idea. We'll put that onto the work programme. Okay, Natalie, so if we could just record that as an action, please, uh, for the Patient Experience Committee, sorry, Patient Safety and Engagement Committee, wrong board, um, <laughs> um, can actually uh, re review the implementation of the, of the Valproate uh, changes. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions? Graham. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned transparency at the start, and I think we'll come back to it at the PSEC um, minutes, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in the report, which I was really pleased to see. And I think the first is the infected blood inquiry, which I've been very involved with personally, and I think it was really great to see June and Alison giving evidence there. And I think it was very much appreciated by the inquiry, which in its later stages, I think we'll find it very valuable. So I thought that was really, really good to see. Uh, and the other thing is that I've been sort of watching the evolution of the yellow card data over the last few weeks, which has been really good and started to play with some of that data, uh, building on Safety Connect. And um, I think it's really exciting to see what might be possible there. And I suppose my question is really in terms of that level of engagement with the data, where does MHRA sit in relation to other regulators and what are others doing? Are you, are you ahead or at level or, or how does it compare? Okay. June, do you want to start? Well, I'd like to thank you for your like to thank you for the comment on the infected blood inquiry, which is really a vitally important opportunity, not just to support the meticulous and rigorous work that's being done, given the public health disaster there, is actually to look at our own systems to see how they're as robust as possibly can be for the future. So it's been a really important um, exercise that I and, and Alison Cave have, have supported. I think on the use of yellow card data, which of course has its strengths and its limitations. I would like to say that the agency is at the leading edge because we're looking at how that data can not only be available for its primary purpose, detecting signals, early warnings and so forth, but that we can integrate with other forms of data as we did for the vaccines so we can have integrated spontaneous data, more evolved monitoring of a cohort and then additional studies. So the various tools that we use to get the most out of that data are cutting edge. And I'd like to maybe take the chance to thank every health professional and patient, member of the public who supports us in that way. Tell us what you know through Yellow Card. We can handle this data through the superb um, IT infrastructure that we have now. Colleagues will have noticed that in December, we launched yet more interactivity so that this tool is not just to receive data from observant members of the public, healthcare professionals, but to use in your own decisions, decisions about prescribing. So let's see that data maximally used. But the short answer is we're at the cutting edge of integrating data and helping other jurisdictions, particularly thinking about Africa, to get that value from everyone who shares the information, the knowledge they've gained. Well, just in relation to that, is, is there a sharing of experience with other regulators then in terms of how you present that? Because I can see that there's going to be some interesting questions coming up. And, and to what extent is that being discussed across agencies? Absolutely. At the uh, leading edge, we have the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. We met in Dublin at the beginning of um, November, and I was very pleased to be part of a, an international panel looking at how we get the best. And now we're looking to shift from a view that was the immediate COVID vaccines and therapeutics view onto how we use that incredible opportunity to keep the finger on the pulse of emerging safety signals worldwide. That's a key forum. Of course, we exchange information with the WHO and with other uh, jurisdictions as needed, but we see the evolution as very much an international role.
Thanks, Chair. Um, June, thank you for the report. R really great to see the, the uh, breadth of work um, that that, um, that is going on in the MHRA. I was especially pleased uh, to, he to hear about the um, Regulators Pioneers Fund and the, the projects that are being funded there. Um, uh, very much so the uh, um, explainability of AI as well, which I think is going to really be um, um, incredible in, in driving adoption and, and nurturing innovation and ultimately benefiting patients. My question is really, how can we maximize our chances of continuing to benefit from um, source of a, a sources of external funding like, like the Regulators Pioneers Fund? Well, thank you, Chair. That's a question we all like to think about uh, in the busyness of daily life, when we have ambitions that are beyond what we would recover through our service fees and others. And uh, grant funding uh, during the pandemic was absolutely critical from the Coalition for Epidemic Innovation Preparedness and obviously from the Gates Foundation. But as we look to target our activities to enable technology and other sources of innovation, use of our real world data, we need to be very much on the on the case with the right ask at the right time. Mm. At this moment, our executive team is really focused on the challenge from the Chancellor in the autumn statement to the government's chief scientist. And this is to look at emerging technologies to enable innovation to reach the public. So we're working closely on that particular initiative. It's moving at a fast pace but clearly to get the right expertise in the agency to work on projects like the Regulatory Pioneers Fund is the key that opens the door. So we're working with the uh, Chancellor's team, the uh, Sir Patrick Balance's team, to ensure that we have a direct link from the ambitions we have to the funding and other resources. So it will open out, I hope, really new vistas for how we can deliver because we've got the commitment to public health that drives that. Fantastic. Okay, thank, thank you, you June. Um, Monday, I think you had a question. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yes, again, very good report, June. Um, I was looking at the, the aspects of how we're improving and transforming our services and the amount of feedback we're getting from other sources. So the customer service centre um, taking a lot, of, uh, a lot of more calls than it did, and we've had the work on supply chain. How are we using that feedback from those new sources to actually improve our services in things like um, established medicines, which is often quite hard uh, when there's lots of exciting new technology. Well, Chair, thank, thanks very much uh, for that. And I'll again say how we value the input of the Organisation Development Remuneration Committee as we seek to incorporate the external feedback in the transformation of services. Um, it's done in a way at the moment that builds on our engagement with industry who are very aware of what the service uh, is, is like in the field as you're uh, aiming to get a new medicine, whether it's an innovative one or a, uh, a new license for an established medicine through to healthcare. So it's local engagement. But I think in terms of broader feedback, uh, we could always expand further. And uh, any signal, any inquiry that comes in through the customer experience centre should be able to feed into our general proactive service, a learning organisation from the input that we get from those who use our services in the broadest sense. So it's a combination, okay. Chair, of local and broader, and it possibly might be for our Chief Comms um, and Engagement Officer uh, a Director to, to give a bit of flavour on the customer experience centre, if you'd like. Rachel, would you like to just add a little more flavour? Yeah, thank you. So uh, something we, we do very proactively in the Customer Experience Centre is to look for trends of um, particular themes that are coming through and then feeding those into uh, different areas of the organisation. Um, so there's a lot of very close working with uh, Laura's area in health quality and access um, in terms of uh, that uh, established medicines work and services to industry. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I w I'm pleased to say that we've been joined uh, by uh, two members who were delayed by the transport issues this morning. So we've got D Dr. Junaid Bajwa, who's uh, one of our non-executive directors, and uh, Catherine Glover, uh, one of the deputy directors from the Department of Health. So welcome to both of you, just for members of the public to know that. And I think, Junaid, you'd like to ask a question. Yes. Good morning, everybody. And apologies again for, for being a bit late. Do an amazing report again. I had a question about the uh, social media campaign that we did on med safety 
and and just the broad impact of that um, uh, around what that actually achieved, perhaps in addition to kind of pushing out the information. And just a, a curious question on: Did we engage primary care, secondary care colleagues as well to amplify the message above and beyond just what we were trying to push out to? Grateful for the question because it's important that we do always think about impact as well as the activities that we seek to undertake to engage social media and other new mechanisms for a real push. And there's no doubt that this year had a maximum outreach, 83 countries, you know, this is something that we, together with the Uppsala Monitoring Centre of the WHO, have actually honed year on year. And I know that it gets to people because I happen to be at a European meeting uh, locally, it happened to be in Malta, where the entire, um, if you like, uh, community through media were talking about how healthcare professionals and patients can support. But your key question is, what impact does it have? Good to know that the total number of yellow cards went up, but clearly the impact has got to be seen through the lens of were there new signals that we didn't know about? Um, because we don't know what we don't know. And I think it's the further analysis of those seven, eight hundred reports, the 26 percent increase delivering those reports that we can really distill. Did we reach parts that we normally don't reach? And that's if we like looking through to primary care has always been a staunch supporter, but actually patients and the public who may not have known that they can tell us about their experiences. So I hope that uh, perhaps at the PSEC committee, we might distill this. We're looking to beginning to be more transparent about signals to see the full cycle of mm. what we learnt and how we should improve this in the future. As I say, it's another leadership role we have at the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities. Thank you. Great. Great. Alison, do you want to add something to that? <clears throat> I was just going to say we highlight Med Safety Week through our Drug Safety Update Bulletin, which does mm. go to all healthcare professionals. So that's one route where we will reach them. As you note in the report, we had 100 extra sign ups to yeah. that bulletin, which is a really useful impact because it's a very important tool for us to communicate safety updates. Great. Well, thank you for that. OK, any further questions for June? June. Oh, Raj. Could you use the microphone, please, Raj? Might help. Um, great report, June. Thank you for, for updating. The question is really around the science and strategy um, component of the of the report. Um, you, you mentioned you'd be work that the agency will be partnering, working with other partners uh, in terms of developing our innovation and science strategy. Have we considered? Any insight that you can share in terms of how we are approaching that? Because there were probably likely to be other ALBs who, from a DH perspective, they're also thinking of the science and strategy component at this time of the year, because it's the right time to be. Any insight you want you can share in terms of how we plan to partner and specifically, you know, who do we plan to reach out to so we get the best synergies that we can? And just for the benefit of members of the public, ALBs are arm's length bodies, uh, which are bodies like the MHRA uh, that work into the Department of Health and Social Care. Stu. Thank you, Stephen. We, I'm pleased to say, have established partnerships and are able to build on these. But it's so important, as Raj has just said, that we actually look through a new perspective, which is the now perspective. What's the areas particularly where we've uh, got an opportunity that we may not have had. And I'd highlight the UK Health Security Agency, the Health Research Authority, and within government, NIHR, the National Institute, Institute Health for Health Research. Uh, those are three particular partners, but that's not to forget about UKRI, UK Research Innovation. and Investment, <laughs> Innovation. And one of the important axes we have through the life sciences vision is with the Office of Life Sciences. So established partners, but I'm taking from the question that now would probably be a very good time to kickstart or refresh now that some of the innovative areas that we've mentioned already, uh, software, artificial intelligence, uh, some of the basic sciences, what we've learned from the mRNA technology that we actually seek to look again at these groupings because they are the ones, as you say, that will provide a synergy that will actually take us forward. And I know that the board is coming back to the science strategy through the 
important key areas board has focused on, genomics being one of them, but actually to refresh that with the opportunities we have now that the mRNA platforms are becoming established, not just for infectious disease, but for cancer. And it's possible that um, Chief Science Research and Innovation Officer Mark could add a little bit more flavour to what I've just said. Mark, would you like to do so? Thank you very much. Um, excellent question, Raj. It's not only the primary healthcare ones where we work together. For instance, we have a lot of collaboration with some of the veterinary bodies because the fundamental science supports that. And we also have do our work, say, with DEFRA and so forth, looking at UK resilience in some of our laboratory capability. The work we're doing with CPRD around data strategies is absolutely linked into a vast number of bodies to actually make sure we've got data equivalents and we're looking at the best quality. So we're constantly monitoring where to work. Um, we also not neglect to mention we collaborate closely with NICE, particularly on, on medical devices where we have various research programs. So looking to build additional ones, uh, but also just making sure that we fit well into the research ecosystem. So I think there's a lot of work going on in that area. Uh, to be honest, do you have something else you want to add, Jim? I wondered if Chief Partnerships Officer would like to reinforce or even add to what we've just said. Sure, I, I just add to it really. I and mean, we've begun some work already working with the system. So we, we look across our life cycle access, innovation, safety, and we work with so far the uh, healthcare sector within one of those topics. Uh, the plan is to work out for 18 months in each of those and bring all the stakeholders together at some point as, as a whole in the room but work towards where their priorities are to support our science strategy and collaboration with them as well as our operational delivery. So um, those are our UK-wide uh, partnerships initiatives to try and support all of this. Great. Okay, I think that's helpful ad additions there. And I think certainly we're, we're aiming to provide an update to the board on the science strategy in March anyway. So I think that's quite timely uh, in terms of the question. Um, I also had a question, June, if, if that's okay. Um, Again, I read with interest um, that we've uh, adopted the chair of the Access Consortium uh, as the MHRA, and I just wondered uh, what your hopes and ambitions were uh, for that uh, chairship. It's an absolute focus for these six months when we have the opportunity and the privilege to lead Australia, Canada, Singapore and Switzerland as the strategy that we adopted with these colleagues um, towards late 21. Uh, sees some fruition and it's a strategy that aligns so well with our own built around innovation around work sharing or reliance as it were and better connections through the health service as we consider that the value of all the work that we do needs to reach patients so different setups in the different jurisdictions are something we can learn from for example on HTA uh, uh, partnerships we align well with Canada, for example. And this is a, a, an area where, given that the consortium is now well established, we were the new kids on the block, as it were, it's been working together since 2007, we can now take forward the next leap working in partnership. And as I say, the area of innovation, all the organizations that we're working with have their own take on this. But if we can embed some of our ideas and adopt some from other jurisdictions, I think that the whole, if you like, 160 million population of a truly international consortium, it is worldwide, unlike any of the other consortia, um, EMA, for example, being Europe, we can now really drive forward um, agendas that will benefit patients. So it's an exciting time and uh, we'll bring back clearly in the context of science and delivery, the various aspects that we're hoping to secure uh, partnership working yeah. on. You see, I think that, bring, that demonstrates the breadth and also the depth uh, of the different relationships that we've got, both nationally and internationally. And the MHRA wants to play its role in, in all of those different fora. So I think uh, if we're content with the report, um, I think the main action is probably down to the Patient Safety and Engagement Committee, if that's okay. I think we, we heard about patient leaflets, we heard about Valproate and we heard about Yellow Card. So I think actually follow-ups at appropriate points um, so I think Mercy is the chair of the committee. I'll allow you to work out the best way to schedule those into your agenda for this year. Um, and that will be very helpful. Um, but I think if everyone's content, I think we should note J June's report with our great thanks to her, the executive team, but also more importantly, the staff of the agency for all the work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much.
That means we can then move on to the next item on the agenda, uh, and that's on page 26. Um, this is what was the financial and people performance of the MHRA for the year up to the 30th of November. And I'd like to just ask John Taylor, our interim chief finance officer, just to make a few introductory comments. But John, you can assume that we've read the report, but any key points you want to highlight to the board? Thank you, Stephen. Um, yes, I think that the, the, the results are tracking as they have in prior months. There is nothing really that is um, should be any of a surprise or inconsistent with the uh, results in the prior months year to date. Um, operational surplus to the end of October uh, is 5.2 million compared to the operational, uh, the budgeted deficit of 2 million. This is uh, mostly a result of underspend on staff costs, which uh, you know is, is, is a known uh, issue. Um, that is expected not to fully reverse, but it is expected, that surplus is expected to shorten to uh, just shy of 2 million by the end of the year. Um, uh, the only other comments, and again, I'll, I'll just, I'll be brief because you've read the report, is that uh, there is again a timing difference on the capital funding, uh, capital spending apologies, which means that we are looking at an overall underspend year today of about 11 million again, um, this is due to timing of spend primarily on the South Mim site and on the RMS. Um, it, it is not an unknown phenomena to have uh, an a, a significant element of the capital funding to be spent in the second part of the year. That is likely and is forecast to, again, uh, shorten to just 700,000 by the end of the year. Um, customer debt, I think that's an issue we've discussed in the past. It has got better and is continuing to improve month on month and there is a typo by the way later on in the report 2.9 where it says it's 70,000 better than um, uh, whereas in fact you'll see do the math it's 700,000 so apologies for that uh, in a way it's good news <laughs> it's not bad news um, yes 40 percent of the debt is less than a month old but what is concerning is 38 percent is over six months old that is the focus there is uh, work being delivered to collect that um, and uh, it, that is pretty much the focus of the customer collection team at this time. Um, people resource, again, read the, resort, read the report. Um, it's a continuing issue. There are continuing vacancies and it's uh, again being addressed. Thank you, John. I think okay. that's very clear. And again, the report uh, you know, you know, reads quite straightforwardly. So, colleagues, any specific questions anyone would like to pick up? Mandy. Yeah, mine was on the on the capital expenditure and the and the underspends that we we have to date. I know there's a projection that we we will spend that money, but our capital programs are always subject to change and investment. And actually, running them on an annual basis is probably unreasonable. So. I'm just wanting assurance that we aren't going to get to the end of the year and we can't make the appropriate investments to continue those programmes going forward because things like RMS, investment in South MIMS are multi-year projects which are fundamental. Yeah, uh, it, it's a valid question. Um, the forecasts from the teams, whether it be South MIMS, it, it's, it's less, South MIMS is, is more to do with um, capital improvements. I'm not going to say less of an issue. It's an issue, but it's, uh, and I'm not going to say easier to catch up. Uh, RMS, clearly it's a multi-year program and that is, uh, and it's crucial. So it is important that that catches up. Uh, the, the latest forecast uh, in terms of whether it's subcontract, whether it's third party spend or whether it is employee spend or whether it is, et cetera, is that that will catch up and we have, it has been analyzed and it has been interrogated. So uh, I can give you as much assurance that the expectation is that that will catch up and is on, broadly speaking, uh, is on track in terms of the programme boards. It might be appropriate at this point, maybe just to bring Catherine, uh, Catherine Glover into the conversation, because obviously when it comes to um, you know, our capital budgets, we're looking at multi-year programmes of work. Uh, and, and Catherine, I just wonder if we could maybe just explain how, we, how the relationship works between MHRA and DH 
uh, you know, Department of Health and Social Care when it comes to the financial planning. Uh, and if there's anything else you'd like to add there, because obviously there is visibility of our requirements for the future years, but they've not yet been agreed, as I understand it. Catherine, can you use the... Oh, sorry, I kept my finger on the button. So um, that's correct. MHRA um, capital spend forms part of the overall DHSC capital spend and is accounted for in that way. Um, MHRA have been um, sharing updated um, profiles of their forecast capital spend with DHSC and DHSC are looking at what they can afford given yeah. the other calls on that capital budget. And hopefully we should give, be able to give yeah. you something more definitive soon. Yeah. See, I, th I think what's helpful, Mandy, is that at our quarterly accountability meetings with the department, you know, we're raising our financial issues. And certainly the last one, the discussion of the requirement for capital, for example, was discussed. And so I think it, I think from the board's perspective, it's not just an MHRA only activity. We absolutely have to be linked in with the Department of Health and Social Care because that's ultimately where the capital will come from. And I hope that gives some assurance that those conversations at least are taking place, even if the decision hasn't yet been made. Yes, I think I think that's really important. That's the importance of having good financial forecasting. Um, I think it's just the assurance that we we won't fall off a cliff at the end of the year as well. And they, these are multi multi year projects, which always have some contingency. They never go quite as planned. Yeah, great. OK, Thanks. thank you for that. Uh, Junaid, I think you had a question. Um, so maybe just guidance from you, Chair. My question was going to be on the vacancies, but that might come up in the, the people plan too. Should I ask the question now and see if it's better? If it's it? related to this particular paper, I'll ask it now. So it's just, it was just the, the 142 vacancies. I know we've discussed this at ODRC. We've been looking at it for some time and it's a concern for us. Well, I just wondered, is there anything here that we could, and, and there was a, a note around half of the posts which are not actively recruited to are covered by fixed term or contingent staff. And the intention is not to actively recruit at this time. Is there anything that we can do to, to fully de-risk, we're such a, it's so important around what we need to do for our people and with our people in order to deliver against all the work that, that we've seen in previous papers. And, it, and I know we've got the, the people paper coming up later. I just wonder if there's more that we should be doing that we're not doing right now to both address the vacancies mm -hmm. and then also think about contract to cover, to cover the other half of the posts that are not mm -hmm. actually being recruited into right now. Maybe I'll bring June in if that's okay at this particular point, because obviously as chief executive, I know the executive committee are monitoring this. I think your question is largely focused on what we can do, do now. Yeah. I, I think the strategy is more about what we're going to do over the next three years. So maybe if we just split, split it up in that way and June, you know, in terms of well, anything else we, extra we can do now. Anything extra? I mean, I want to first say that this is a top priority. We know it's absolutely key to the success of the organisation. It's on our agenda pretty much every time we meet, which is a couple of times a week that we're driving and driving. And I'm pleased that um, actually we've seen the reduction of the non-recruited two vacancies down to 30. For an organisation of this size, uh, that's recruitment in progress. So it, we are driving as hard as we can and we're aware that we, in some cases, are fishing in a small pool because the talent is needed, um, you know, in other, uh, if you like, life science uh, spheres, including the industry. And we have some limitations, but we're looking to use every tool in the toolbox, including uh, market supplements and so forth. And it's one of the issues I'll be talking with in the context of the challenge to Patrick Vallance as to how we can actually make a time with us, driving forward regulation, something really good to have on your career. Don't forget, working in regulation isn't a life role. It can be for part of a career that can be the best part of your career. So we're, we've never taken our eye off this at the executive in the time uh, since the uh, size and shape was agreed by the board. Um, Maybe we'll pick up the longer term yeah. later. Exactly. Uh, but, th but the last news I had, which was yesterday, uh, started to make us feel there was light at the end of the yeah. tunnel. Yeah. And I think it's not all bad news, actually. And I was wondering if I could maybe bring Laura, Laura Squire, Chief uh, Healthcare Quality and Access Officer, into the discussion. Because I think, yeah, Laura, you've had some recent successes of bringing some people on board. So I know you've still got some vacancies, but I think you've also had some successes of bringing some good people into the agency. Yes, we, we have, Stephen. I'm absolutely, I'm still thrilled with the fact that I've got five deputy directors now, um, with the uh, one starting in, in, um, in December and uh, the also on innovative medicines and then on population health. Um, we've got a new DD, Gillian Beach, who came in on the 3rd of January. So that is superb because yeah. it really starts, it means that we can start to lead as a, as a team. 
um, we actually met before he came in as a team with, an ex with a coach to try and start working together yeah. on that. We have also brought in quite a lot of pharmaceutical assessors um, in, in recent months. There is a challenge around that, and it now means that we have quite a high proportion of trainees in our area, which will have a, a demand on existing staff before it starts to yeah. feed into to fee income. But it does feel like there are there are there uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are still certain areas, I think, where there are problematic recruitment, and those are ones quite often where it's very there are very com very competitive salaries in industry so around gmp is an area of challenge but on that we are working with recruitment agencies as well and doing everything we can including talking about secondments to see about how we can fill those vacancies so lots of parallel strategies happening on that yeah okay so i think there's some positive news there as well junaid as well as the challenge so uh, alison did you want to add something i just wanted to add for reassurance and safety and surveillance which is highlighted as an area of higher vacancy, we had 20, um, 27 um, either new starters are about to start in the last couple of months and 28 recruitments underway. So really active work in order to manage that, that because, because it is a clearly uh, important area. And as Laura mentions, there will be a bit of a lag as those yeah. new starters are trained up, but then the impact will then begin to be felt in the teams. Yeah. And we shouldn't underestimate the huge amount of effort it takes to recruit people. So it takes a lot of time. But getting the right people on board, yeah, you know, let's grow, you know, grow, grow and develop our people. It's about living the strategy that we'll talk about shortly, actually, in many ways. So thank you for everything that everybody's doing on that. Um, Graham, did you have a question? Yeah, um, related. I mean, I was looking at the financial report and it was very clear. So thank you for that. Um, but I was thinking about the cost of living crisis and I was wondering what the organisation can do, really. It's a question of naivety because I don't know what's possible in my own organisation. We've been able to give one off payments. Um, to staff. I don't know if that's something that BMHRA has considered or, or can even do. I'd be interested to hear. Okay. Uh, John, would you like to pick that one up? Good question. Um, I, I, I'm not a civil servant, so I think the, but, but uh, anything that we do has to be governed by civil service rules in terms of um, uh, what can and cannot be done. June, would you agree with that? June? Um, yes, Chair, absolutely. But um, there are various opportunities, for example, with um, season tickets and so forth, uh, you know, lump in uh, payments that colleagues then would find extremely challenging in the present climate and uh, the, the support to be had. And I know our HR team, our human resources team are very available to discuss when someone has this kind of um, payment that, that needs to be made. But I think taking away from this discussion, uh, it is so important that we're alert to the cost of living pressures, particularly around energy bills. And let's um, take away to see what further flexibilities we have, knowing that, um, as I say, this this crisis affects everyone. Graham, it looks like you want to come back. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think things like season tickets usually are advances rather than payments. So I think it would be interesting to know if there's something across the organisation that could be done. And if that was affordable, it might be interesting to explore. Yeah. That. OK, I think thank you for that. Any other questions, colleagues? Okay, I, I had one if I can. Um, and John, a financial one. So in terms of the debt, uh, I, I do accept that it's clearly come down from 12.7 million to 12 million. That is progress. So thank you for that. Um, but in terms of the makeup of that debt, have you got a clear idea of the number of companies that that involves? Simple answer is yes, we do. There is a detailed listing of, of who owes what. Um, as we've said, uh, or I've has been discussed in the past, an, an element of that older debt is, is less um, uh, people being invoiced and just refusing to pay. It is to a certain extent to do with some of the process issues that are legacy and are being and will be solved by RMS. So it is a question of getting the invoice out, getting everything receipted, getting GRNs, and I'm, I'm delving really into accounting world here, so apologies for that. Um, but they are being dealt with case by case, invoice by invoice, or service by service, delivery by delivery. But yes, there was a very clear idea of who is owed what uh, and since when. Because I'm also wondering whether, you know, I know we've also got a backlog, or particularly in the area of established medicines, whether that we actually can link the two things together. And we use uh, those companies that, for example, have not paid their bills, their applications are not progressed until they have paid their bills. And I just wonder whether we can start linking uh, if you like, our sort of financial responsibility with our public health responsibility. Now, I know there may be some issues around that, but I'm wondering whether we can link the two. It is a difficult 
uh, area. Um, we have issued and published a new income recognition, income collection policy, where broadly speaking, uh, we, we, for new business, certainly new business, if someone has not paid, we do have to question whether we should be delivering services to them. Um, there might be some public interest areas where we probably would, but that has to be an operational decision. But from a, a generic financial position, yes, we do have to start questioning delivery of service where someone, those rare situations where we have invoiced, everything is in order, everything is agreed, but they just don't want to pay. Simple answer is well, yes. Don't want to or, or can't. Or can't, yes. Okay. You know. okay. <clears throat> but again, Laura, just thinking from a sort of a, an operational perspective, you know, what are the implications of taking that type of approach that would uh, either you think would be a benefit or a disadvantage? I think there would be, a, a, it would be a very interesting conversation to have. I think what I'm thinking is probably what we would have to do is in other situations, we have other situations, for example, where there is a, you know, there might be a, a supply problem or there might be a recall that we have to take on the, the thing, thing we always take into consideration as we talk to DHSC and the NHS about what is the actual drug yeah. and what is it needed for? So the first priority is what's the patient need? And I think that may mean that we would have to progress some things potentially, but subject yeah. to that, I think that's an interesting conversation that, that John and I can mm. pick up after this meeting. I think it, start, it starts by linking the data sets. You know, I think, I think where it, it is a single product where there's no other alternative, it would be madness to stop that application being progressed. However, if it's the 15th drug that's already on the market, and a particular company has not paid, I don't see why we should be as an agency progressing that application until they've cleared their debt. Because, you know, we are not a charity, we are not a bank, we are a public agency doing a public service. And therefore, I think it's only right that we're appropriately paid for that. Uh, purely from a financial perspective and from a uh, best stewardship of public funds perspective, I completely agree with you. Okay. So could I maybe suggest that we take an action for John and Laura just to investigate, you know, start to explore what is possible. We must not take any decisions that are going to harm the public or public health in any way. So let's, let's start off with that as the starting point. But where there is a potential to help to prioritise our established medicines in particular, um, then let's do so with that knowledge. But, you know, and, and, and we can uh, you know, let you review that and think about it. Okay. Raj, did you want to come back on that? Quick clarification question. Mm -hmm. um, you said there is the group that don't and there's the group that can't. What is the reason for the don't? Is it because they're out of business? If they're still selling a product, there must be revenues coming in, which is then very relevant to Stephen's point. Do, do we have any insight on why they don't? I don't think there is a generic reason. As I say, uh, in, in a significant number of cases, it, it is a result of the legacy process and systems that are being solved through RMS, which means um, they, they haven't, because they haven't potentially been invoiced in time, or they haven't um, recognized the invoice, they haven't good received note the invoice, they have received the service, but from their own internal per, uh, process, they can't match what we've billed them to what they ordered. Uh, it is a bureaucracy, I'm going to say bureaucracy, it's with a little b, not a big b, um, and it is very manual process of us following up with representatives of them and matching the invoice two, two, two. Uh, in the case of people who everything is matched, but they just don't want to pay us, there is no generic reason that, that yeah. there is a whole host of reasons. Uh, sometimes just simply, I don't want to. Yeah. It's, are, it's rarely, it is rare, what I can say, it is rarely an issue of, sorry, apologies, it is okay rarely an issue of you didn't give good service that that is and that in in, my, in in the in private sector that is often the case of we don't agree that you delivered what you said you were going to deliver that is not the case is rarely the case okay i think we, we don't need to try and solve it today but i think it's a it's, it's a it's a piece of work that i think will be worth exploring to see what we can do because i think the agency should be paid for the work that it does uh, just as a fundamental principle um okay so in terms of the finance and people report, if there are no other questions, can I suggest that we note that report with our thanks? But uh, again, the clarity of the information is really helpful so we can understand the issues we're dealing with. So thank you for that, John, and for the team that put this together. So thank you very much. If we then move on to the next item, which is on page 36, um, 
This is uh, an assurance report from the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee. Um, now, unfortunately, the chair of this particular committee, Michael Whitehouse, is unfortunately unable to be here today. So I've asked Paul, White, uh, Paul Goldsmith, uh, who's a member of that committee, just to make a couple of introductory comments. You can assume we've read the report, Paul, but any particular points you want to draw to the board's attention from Michael's report? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things I'd sort of like to lift out of it um, for some broader board reflections. I mean, some for subsequent board meetings and uh, when specific topics are timetabled. Um, and, I mean, the first one really health and safety um, to uh, assure that the issues are being addressed appropriately and with sufficient resource. A SAPO license was a specific board concern um, and it's a phased approach to renewal um, and agreement with HSE for SAPO for storage only license. And I think the question really for, for us, and maybe this will come up in Mark's discussion in, in March, is what level of capabilities actually do we need long term? Um, uh, so we get the appropriate licenses in place, thinking what, what is our role in the broader UK resilience. Um, on the, some of the finance aspects, uh, there was discussion on value of a move to full accounting of time and as cost of every everyone, um, but agreed that this would be a phased rollout to make it doable. Um, payroll remains of particular concern. I mean, the building blocks are clearly there, but it's completing the circle um, with the right framework um, and links between finance and HR, clarity on who is accountable, roles and responsibilities, which do appear to be in, being addressed, but we need to make sure that that is actually followed through and it does happen because it's slipped before. Um, a good discussion on risk from the new lead Paris um, Premier's a um, who is going to work closely with GIAA and, and it may be worth the non-execs organising individual sessions with her. I, I had a good session with her. Um, and I think the hope is she's going to take our risk management approach to a more sophisticated level. And I think, again, as a board, it's thinking about how the flow of risk is appetite and approach flows from the board right through all of the organisation and ensuring that we get appropriate engagement from all staff and that, that it's used in a way that risk should be used. And then finally, the ILAP audit, um, I think it was actually a largely positive audit uh, and it's sort of more wanting to draw out learnings for the future when we're doing an edit projects, particularly when there are multiple stakeholders involved, that there's a strategic change process in place um, and that there's an assurance process for that change process. Thank you, Chair. Any particular questions anybody would like to raise as far as this particular report is concerned? M Mercy. Just a comment, really, um, in that PSEC also looks at complaint handling, but from a different angle than, than what's um, covered um, in audit. Um, and that also I was involved um, as chair of PSEC in um, risk management kind of horizon scanning as well, which I found really, really useful. Um, so we, we do kind of overlap sometimes from um, audit um, risk and assurance committee with the other committees, but yep. we're, we're pulled in where necessary and we try and coordinate that. So yep. just to make that clear to the board as well. Yeah, and, and, and as we've used uh, joint meetings from time to time, when there are a, a single topic that we want to look at it through two lenses, having a joint committee is a better use of executive time than having two committee meetings and two different topics and two sets of papers, but uh, it will be a view. But I think, yeah, I know that's been done before, so keep looking for the opportunity. But Paul, you want to come back? Yeah, and, and as well as that um, joint internal meetings, one of the things we discussed and encouraged was to think about um, joint meetings or workings with other arm length bodies yeah. in terms of their risk approach and, 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 and thinking about external risk and the whole system. Okay. Thank you for that. Colleagues, any other thoughts or questions? June, I think you want to make a point. Well, I'd, I'd really like to thank Paul for coming in to, to, to lead this report and also for the emphasis on health and safety. And just to really say it's been at the forefront um, of executive committee discussions since we had the session back in August, knowing that, that some of the issues, particularly around the SAPO license, are critical to our science strategy. And I think it might be worth just asking Chief Science Research and Innovation Officer for the latest position. The safety of our staff to do this vital work is is has got to be paramount. Um, Mark, 
Absolutely, I agree with that. I'm very, very encouraged with the work of health and safety for, uh, throughout the past few months. I particularly want to thank the staff. Um, a lot of what we do comes from staff volunteering to do roles such as fire wardens, safety champions, investigating leads. We've had a huge number of volunteers. We've filled virtually all of those places. We've got a few to fill in, and that all represents the staff actually volunteering and embracing health and safety uh, closely. So that's magnificent. On top of that, we've closed off any of the health and safety reportable in incidents. We have the containment you mentioned functioning at SAPO 3, so that we already are providing some of our resilience and have uh, agreement with HSE how we're bringing it forward to bring it back up to SAPO 4. So very good progress and thanks again to the staff. Great. And just for members of the public, Mark, can you translate SAPO? SAPO is the Specified Animal Pathogens Order. So uh, as we know, COVID-19 and influenza, these are infections that can leak from animals to humans. Yeah. So as part of our uh, pro, uh, performance in uh, preventing pandemics, we have to be able to cover some animal pathogens as well. Yeah, that, that, thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, colleagues. Okay, I had another question, if I may, um, and it's, I'll direct it directly to John, um, if that's okay. Um, uh, just in 6.2, um, the report talks around uh, whether yeah, the Treasury or the cabinet, of, cabinet Office might find any other issues that would get in the way of the timetable for the audit. And I just wondered if there'd been any update on that. Uh, no update, and um, to my knowledge, in terms of uh, discussions we've had already uh, there isn't anything that should get in the way so at this stage the timetable looks completely yes. achievable absolutely okay that was just what i wanted to clarify yeah. so thank you for that i appreciate that um as sash you could promote vanessa now if that's okay um and okay so just uh, before we uh, uh conclude um can i assume the board is content that we note this report for assurance Again, with our thanks uh, to Paul and also to Michael and the committee. Also, I'd just like to uh, introduce uh, Claire Harrison. Claire, unfortunately, the travel things didn't work for you very well today, but just to, for the benefit of the members of the public, Claire Harrison, our Chief uh, Digital and Technology Officer, has also joined us, just so the audience can see the, uh, the board is now complete. So thank you for getting here, uh, Claire. Um, so on that basis, um, I'd like to move on to the next item, uh, which is around how will the new MHRA people strategy improve the recruitment, diversity development and retention of our staff to deliver our statutory responsibilities? Uh, this is on page number 41. And I can see that uh, Vanessa Birchall Scott, our director of HR, is in the process of joining the call. Can you hear us, Vanessa? I can. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Yes, I don't know why it's not coming on to... Oh, done it now, I think. Can you see me now? Uh, not yet, but uh, we can hear you at the very least. So, okay, uh, okay so thank you for joining. Uh, Vanessa is our Director of uh, Human Resources here at the MHRA and has obviously been very much involved in, uh, in uh, developing this new strategy. Um, uh, so we we're very pleased to welcome you, Vanessa. So thank you for joining us for this session. Um, you can assume that the board has read the report, so we don't want a presentation on page by page. But are there one or two key points that you would like to bring to the board's attention so we can spend most of our time this morning on discussion? Yes, thank you very much. And um, firstly, a quick introduction, um, if I may. So whilst the people's strategy um, so far published internally and available to board members is a strategy and so a statement of intent combined with a long-term plan of action. It does go beyond this to include more of the detail of what we are planning in that first year, some more detailed measures of success which we will be monitoring and publishing and links to documents like the Culture Action Plan, which themselves provide even more of the detail of what we will do and indeed how we will do it and when, as well as that intended outcome and performance measures, which tell us if we're heading in the right direction or need to change. So of course, as a statement of intent uh, and long and linked shorter term plans of action, it's only of value if we do what we say we're going to do. And that is recognised as the collective responsibility of all of the agency's people, albeit heightened responsibility and indeed accountability for agency leaders at all levels. 
The focus now needs to be on more of the how and indeed implementing actions which lead us to the desired outcome. So creating the reality of what we're setting out to achieve short and longer term with the people strategy, if you like, in our eye line as we move forward. In terms of areas for focus, and certainly within the Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee, I was asked the question about which, if we were to focus on one or two, did I think would have the most impact? I would say that it's worth a cross-reference here to the people survey feedback. And generally in any people survey, in any organization, uh, there's a strong indication that the line manager has a critical role to play in terms of how people feel about work and the environment they work in. And so those with a leadership role, and this doesn't have to mean line or team management, impact across all of the various strategy strands. So what happens in terms of attracting and retaining, developing, including, supporting, everything to do with the way we do things, that culture that we often refer to, and indeed performance. So if I were to pick one thing, it would be our commitment to leadership development and the leader's roles in progressing this strategy. If I had a chance to pick another, I would again refer to the people survey and we know that pay and benefits and clearly I'm aware that this was um, referenced earlier is something that we've always scored very low on. In fact, across the whole civil service, there's a very low score in this particular area. And so we already look to what further um, pay flexibilities we have available to us each year. There's an annual pay award which sets a cap and we can't go above that, but we can flex how we actually use that pay award. And for example, in the last couple of years, um, we have focused paying larger sums to those lower down in the grade from a salary point of view and those in the very lower grades. And we have focused the payments in a way that means that we are gradually reducing the spans so that those who are lower paid receive something a bit more than, than those who are on the higher paid salary. So that's just an example, but we want to continue to look at flexibilities. There's already a capability-based scheme that we're looking at and we've been revising, but also to look at the broader package that employee value proposition is called, uh, but basically what we offer to staff broadly across the whole range of both financial and non-financial offer. And that includes as well, just to refer back to the finances, the fact that we engage with a third party organization to provide confidential coaching and counseling to staff. And that includes where they've got issues with finances. Okay, thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, that's a helpful sort of, uh, you know, setting the context, as it were. Uh, so I uh, appreciate your input on that. Um, Mandy, could I maybe come to you next as, as chair of the Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee? Uh, any other observations that you'd like to share? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. And, and thanks, Vanessa. We, we did have quite a lively discussion at ODRC about um, areas in the, in the people strategy. And I think... What, we've, what we found was the content was very, very good, very comprehensive. It covered all aspects of um, how, what employees would expect and, and, and from culture to training, development, those, those aspects. I think one of the things we discussed was the importance of communication and connecting with everybody in the agency and how we can bring uh, things like the strategy to life a little bit. Um, much more about examples and stories. It was felt really, are we really putting ourselves in the shoes as, as, manage, as a management team or a board, putting ourselves in the shoes of, of somebody who isn't on the leadership, um, uh, on Exco or on the board? And how does it feel to them to be part of the agency? And can we actually tell more stories around the successes? Because it was also noted that the MHRA does have a very good reputation outside of um, the organisation, across, across industry, other um, health bodies and in the healthcare sector. And are we actually um, really enabling our staff to understand that and letting them tell their stories more? So I think that was probably one of the most important parts. How can we bring this strategy to life 
So it answers the question, what does this mean for me? Okay, well, maybe we can actually go around the table and ask a few other people around some ideas on that. But Vanessa, how, how, how in your view, uh, would you recommend that we bring this strategy to life, uh, as Mandy suggests? Yeah, so I absolutely agree with Mandy. And to an extent, we already do that. If you take, for example, um, the work around inclusion and use of our insight intranet, uh, especially around particular events and timings of the year, celebrations, etc. We often ask for colleagues, especially in the inclusion group and other networks, to provide blogs. Um, because what staff I'm sure don't want to see all the time is people like myself and others on exec team or whatever talking about what we think should happen in the future they do want those examples so examples of people who've maybe faced a challenge and have then managed to work their way through or able to take advantage of an opportunity in the organization safe around learning or whatever um, so we will certainly be doing more of that and we're already working, we meet the uh, senior HR and senior comms team meet uh, every other week and it's on our agenda in terms of right now we've got it published, this is the focus now, we need to make it real and make it reality to people and what can we do more around um, publishing stories but also at that local level and through SMTs uh, and leaders within organisations for all of those leaders, even at a relatively junior level, to take on board the fact that they have responsibilities that are outlined within this strategy document to progress these issues at a local level. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Uh, maybe Claire, Claire Harrison is our Chief Technology and uh, uh, Digital and Technology Officer, sorry. Um, just wondering how you, you, you're bringing this to life in your team, because I know you do a, a lot of work in this area. In as many ways as I can think of. So uh, some big, some small. Um, I have lots of links of industry. So say with recruitment and retention, um, we will do um, shadowing and sort of informal placements and that kind of thing. And they're really building up momentum. Also linked with other digital data and um, technology departments across government doing the same. Mm -hmm. um, also just pushing so this is a small way for example you've been to my town hall that we have every couple of weeks and before I joined um it used to be my role who would chair it and talk a lot um so I've I, I stopped doing that and asked other people regardless of role grade job to to chair them because again it's building up um experience in a sort of safe environment albeit with a hundred odd people in presenting but also doing it in their way and communicating what they want to do as well so everything along the spectrum really I think we can get a little bit better and I don't want this to come across as a criticism but whatever it is so I am trying to do more external events, um, so not going to the opening of an envelope, but just um, a, a select few around the country and um, talk about what we do in digital data and technology. There are so many good examples um, and I need to promote those better. So one, a couple of months ago, just before Christmas, I popped a note to comms and asked them to just tweet it, but we couldn't because I'd not given enough notice so i think we can be a bit more dynamic and yeah. just go for it and a bit less risk averse mm. in that um in that respect so yeah, yeah uh, i could talk a lot more about it but i don't want to yeah no I, I i think it, i think there's a strong element of engagement there isn't there claire and i, and I think certainly yeah. having been to one of your town hall meetings i know hader you were at the last one so uh you, you know i think as, as as board members we're more than happy to uh to engage with staff whenever it's helpful um so uh, you yeah, know please take the opportunity for the colleagues too so um, just, thank, while, thank you just for that. while i've got the mic um i have a question actually one for mandy and one for vanessa if okay, that's okay go for it so vanessa mine is um all the work that we're doing how does that compare and contrast with um, comparable organisations? So whether it's colleagues in DHSC or CQC and so on, I'm just curious about that. And if we have those sort of strong links and then for Mandy. Why don't we take them one at a time? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Vanessa? 
Yes, no, that's fine. Uh, yes, we do certainly link. I mean, I, I guess especially closely with DHSC and UKHSA, but also the whole group of ALBs and indeed network across the civil service and many of us in HR have other professional networks too. So, uh, and the last thing we ever want to do is reinvent a wheel. So there is a lot of sharing across those various networks, whether we're the ones that are leading and are sharing, which sometimes we are, or in Indeed, we're borrowing from others and tailoring and tweaking as we go. But the whole, especially in the public sector, that whole I referenced earlier, employee value proposition, what's the whole package? So that includes not just the finances, because there is only so much we can do about that. Must never forget that pension scheme because that's definitely a big financial um, add-on but there are many things we can do around the training and development that we offer around the flexible working approaches around the culture of the organization we have and people do look at that whole package finance is important of course but I think it is that whole package and really everyone especially in the in the public sector is having to look at that broader picture okay thank you and your second question Claire? For Monday, just when you were talking about the feedback and um, people wanting to talk more um, uh, about the things that they want to talk about, just um, just to clarify what you meant there, because I wasn't at that ODR fee. Um, so just one of the points that you made around comms, if, if any more detail yeah. was provided. Okay, Mandy. Yeah, I think it, it emphasises a little bit what Vanessa was also saying. So if pay and conditions are really important, then we ought to address that very openly around what we can and what we can't do. And I think from the feedback that um, everyone has with their line managers, there will be messages come through, either uncertainty about our strategy, all of those things, so that we address that, so that people understand what does, particularly this is in the context of transformation, um, and that some of the feedback we had, I'll discuss it on the ODRC paper, was perhaps transformation was seen as um, the organisational restructure, which was perhaps seen in a negative way in reduction. Whereas what we're, we're not doing well enough at the moment is painting that positive picture of the impact that working here has mm -hmm. on the world, uh, on patients and public health. Um, and are we clear enough in what we're expecting of all of our staff members mm. to and their contribution to that bigger picture, which was other feedback that came back through the uh, the Gateway Zero review, which was an external review. Yeah. So it's, okay. it's those sort of aspects I'm looking at. Claire. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I'm conscious that a number of people want to make question, uh, ask questions. So can we maybe uh, think about concise answers, please? Uh, but Alison, I think you wanted to make a, a point. Yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit on the... Uh, developing exceptional people and people leaders here because we've been talking a lot about uh, people leaving the agency but actually if you look at it in a very positive light actually working at the agency also sets you up and provides opportunity for onward career development but just to also note that through the transformation process a lot of people have been successful actually in gaining promotion within the agency which shows the huge advantage and need to continue to develop and and uh, provide opportunities for development for our for our staff. And we're certainly trying to do that. It's critical that we do carve out the time for that. And that's been something that's been challenging for people. But certainly within my team, people are doing MSCs. They're also doing fellowships. We're trying to put in more thinking about secondment opportunities and more matrix working as well as lunch and learn sessions and external speakers coming in. So sort of that is an additional package yeah. of measures we're trying to enhance. Yeah, and I, I think that's really helpful. And, and I think also just to sort of make the point that um, this strategy is obviously the MHRA strategy. Um, I attended a meeting yesterday with uh, other ALB chairs and chief, chief executives primarily, um, looking at actually how can we work across the arm's length bodies within the Department of Health family thinking of talent management, because it isn't always just around developing talent just for the MHRA. If we want to develop really fulfilling, transformative careers, 
then working across a number of different parts of the Department of Health family would be really good experience. It would help to bind the arms link bodies together, and it would also give really good, solid career foundations for people to develop their careers inside or outside the civil service. So I think there's more to be done by working within the MHRA, but also with our arms link body colleagues as well. So that's at an early stage. Okay, Raj, do you want to ask a question now? Thank you, Stephen. Just in that same vein, when we are for recruitment, is it feasible or could we even think about joining forces with other arm length body and doing a recruitment in block? Because we're, the reason why I'm saying that is we often go after the same skill sets. And so it's very much if you go in collectively, uh, if, it's, if you're going after the same skill set, I think there are some good opportunities there. Yeah. Time, effort, you know, but also a lot more interesting for applicants. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you, if you then build on that, what you just said about yeah. the rotation pieces, I think that could be potentially very attractive. I think particularly at a graduate entry level, yeah. I, th I think we probably need to separate this into you know, what's entry level, what's mid-career level and what's senior leadership potential, because I think actually the needs might be different in those areas. So I think that's still forming at this stage. So, but I think looking beyond just the MHRA is something that this ALB group wants to look at. But Claire, we, you want to come we, back in? We do that. It's common across government. So if we're, if we're recruiting for solution architects or product managers and so on, often we will join up with yeah. others. So, um, but not across every speciality, I think, is the point. Uh, you know, and I think particularly in areas like advanced therapies, uh, AI, uh, data engineering, you know, there's a real demand for skills like that. And, and, and actually, they're not always, uh, you know, done available and if we could think about how we could work collectively even shared roles maybe across ALBs mm -hmm. maybe another thing we could think about so I think we need to think more broadly than just this is the MHRA only requirements is, is, is a perspective but we've more more work to do on that I think okay Paul um it's sort of a history question really I mean if having only been here just over a year if you to compare this plan with a previous um people plan what would be the differences? Oh, good question. Vanessa, can you answer that one? Yes, that is an interesting one. I think that the agency was a very different place and the environment that the agency was operating in was a very different place, a matter of a few years ago. Um, and as a result, we had slightly different challenges it's still the case that you know we had particular roles that were uh, tricky to recruit to but the environment has certainly heated up if i can put it that way in terms of the market uh, from a recruitment point of view um and uh, financially in all honesty we were in a much better place we were able to use some of the uh, money that we had available in reserves in a positive way uh, for specific pieces of work that we did and so on. So I think it's more a case of that we've moved on. There will be some strands which are very similar because you always need to think about recruitment and retention, you know, right people, right place, right time, right performance, etc. So there will always be that core moving through. But as the environment within the organisation and outside of the organisation change, you need to change. And I think this is a, a step change in the right direction in the way that we've moved to one agency and that's a step change in the right direction okay paul does that answer the question um sort of because i'm just sort of looking for sort of assurances as to why this would be successful where it may not have been successful in the past and is it the case that it's a historian would say well it's a similar plan but now we're we're a better informed organization better able to implement it vanessa I suppose I would say that it, it is a, no, I think it's quite a different plan, actually, because of the reasons I've explained. The agency itself has undergone a transformation and we knew that um, not only did we need the practicality of a, an organisational change structurally, but also from a cultural point of view, we needed to change because mm. the environment had changed. And we need to move not just forward with it, but ahead of it if we possibly can. So I think it is quite different. Do I think it will have more success than um, than previous plans? Well, yes, I hope so. I hope that uh, obviously the board, uh, the executive team, the leadership within the organisation, the way we've recruited into leadership roles, etc., will give us a head start on taking it forward because I think there's a big responsibility there to make sure that it it comes into reality. 
Okay. Uh, June, was there anything else you wanted to add? It's a holistic plan. Mm. That's, that's the great value. In my knowledge, we've never had one that actually brought everything together. And we realise that if we're going to have this step change, it needs to make sense as a complete package. Secondly, we're going to own it. You know, that whole business about knowing, feeling and doing. We're going to make it a reality by doing and keeping it constantly through stories and, uh, you know, every which way. Uh, including areas that uh, you may know about that we're looking to have a shadow for the executive committee and for the one agency leadership group. So that ownership of the whole package it may sound rather conceptual, but it's actually, if we make that real, then we will take our people strategy to a new level. Okay, I think that's, that's helpful. Mercy, did you want to come in? Uh, just to comment on diversity, really, um, and the importance of that. Um, so I just wanted to know from Vanessa, obviously, um, we have inclusion networks, um, and also we have a diversity lead. Um, but always diversity is a very kind of difficult area and culturally to, to tackle. And I just want to know um, what kind of evidence bases that are we using to monitor this strategy through? Because it's really important as, as you know, a changing culture, especially we've got new people coming yes. in, we're transforming our services. It's, it's a difficult ask in any organization and we're, we have challenges on it. So I don't want to lose that diversity issue and, and things which is so important to build up an inclusive culture for this organization and I was just wondering Vanessa what what thoughts you have on that and and really do we have clear evidence on our baseline before we we go forward with it because I'm also uh, aware that that um, organizations can lose out on diversity as well as improve it so we always presume that things will get better but sometimes they can get worse so I just wanted a bit of uh, assurance and um, considering that we have got kind of uh, limited um, resource as well to, to draw yeah. on. Uh, Vanessa, just concisely, please. Yes, thank you. So we have an overarching inclusion uh, group and a number of sub networks that feed in with special um, specific interests. And we work very closely with them. The idea is that the networks are chaired by staff themselves. It's not an HR thing. Uh, and actually, the inclusion group undertook their own survey, an anonymous survey, which we supported, which they fed back on. We've also got the people survey itself, which uh, carries a number of questions and therefore we have the feedback in terms of data and free text that's come back around uh, issues and areas on inclusion. We carry on with some of those questions in our quarterly pulse survey. Uh, obviously we have links, uh, very strong links with our staff union representatives in the staff partnership committee and then we are able to analyse the data that we have which can show for example well the profile of staff that we have by grade, by different categories, where people are getting promoted, how that's working. So it's a, a mashup of all of that intelligence, if you like, hard and soft intelligence to keep us on track with identifying where we need to focus our attention. Okay, excellent. Okay, I think I think there's a, a, a lot of you know, general support, just, just from a personal point of view, in terms of just my own perspective. You know, I, I think actually we've identified, you know, some really important areas here about attracting and retaining the best people, developing exceptional people, particularly on, on, on people leaders, diversity in promoting well-being, investing in the healthy culture, enabling great performance and delivery. So I'm, I'm really comfortable personally with, with all of the different component parts. There's one thing I'm not comfortable with, if I'm honest, uh, and I, I just in the interest of transparency, uh, is actually the title of the strategy. Uh, because actually, I, I find it somewhat inconsistent to say we want to put our people first, and that we also want to put in a different strategy, putting patients and the public first. And I don't think we can have two firsts. And actually, I think that the role of the agency, from my perspective, is to protect and improve patient and public health. So putting patients first feels like the right thing to do. And I think we need a different title for this strategy, which might be around, I don't know what it is, but maybe valuing our staff, yeah, con yeah, encouraging a contribution from our staff, providing fulfilling careers, a great place to work, whatever it is, I think that is more relevant than saying putting our people first, because we can't put the patients and our people first. 
And there's also something about the language, our people. And I would have thought a language around us might actually feel more inclusive if, I, if, I, if I'm frank. So I'm sorry to be negative about one really small component, which is just the title of the document, but I think it does frame the way we think about this. This is not our people. We're not, we, we're not lords and masters. You know, the reality is it's our organization, you know, and we're all in this together. And I think we need to give that feel. So I think the frame of the strategy is quite important. So, so June, I, I know this went through the executive committee and you obviously made a conscious decision on this, but I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to revisit that. Absolutely. Like the discussion, the great discussion we've just had, we focused on content. Yeah. We focused on, is this giving the right emphasis? Have we brought together the right things to fulfill the ambition to make the agency a great place to work? I think your points are well made. We're here for the people, the public, the patients who are the recipients of medicines, medical devices, blood components, and so forth, have to be assured that we're on the case of their safety and their, their benefits. But I think what's in a name, let's take it away. We've had a great discussion today. Let's embody our ambition for us, with us, by us, as the most inclusive way we can present this to everyone. As I said earlier, we need to own it and live it now. Yeah. And measure as we go forward, you've asked the right people, measure it to make sure that we're heading in the right direction on every aspect, that it's only going to succeed if the whole is the sum of the parts and that we own it. So let's take that away as a competition and maybe, Chair, we'll get our staff to name it. I think that will be a fantastic idea, June. So uh, thank, thank you for that. I, th I think, I think it's a, this is about the culture of the organisation. It's not just a dry strategy. It's about how we want to work, how we collectively want to work together. OK, so, but I think actually with, with that one small exception, I think we can be very supportive uh, and endorse this particular strategy. So I know a lot of team, people have been involved in this. So thank you very much to everyone who's been involved in this. That's very much appreciated. Um, the, the strategy itself has been approved by the executive committee. So our role is to endorse and to note it. So I think we can do that with our thanks. OK, thank you very much. And thank you, Vanessa, uh, for your contribution today. Much appreciated. So if we can move on, please, uh, to the next item on the agenda, uh, page 47. That's the assurance report from the Organisational Development and Remuneration Committee. So, Mandy, any, you can assume we've read it, but any key points you want to draw to our attention? OK, thanks, Stephen. And uh, I think the preceding item was also, it was a high on the agenda and we had quite a good discussion, which is very congruent with the discussions today. So I won't say very much more about that. I think... Uh, one of the key areas we discussed was the, the criticality of the transformation programme. And, and I would say um, it has reached a critical stage in its rollout now. I think we had a, a few very encouraging steps forward. One is the, um, the new SRO who's been appointed as director of delivery. I think that's a very positive step for the agency. And SRO is senior, senior responsible, responsible officer. officer. So, um, a uh, senior level person who's taking this forward, who is in-house um, and, and is working collaboratively across all of the, um, the groups. So I think, can't emphasise enough, we are at a critical stage in that transformation programme now and how that goes forward. I think uh, the other thing um, we did uh, get progress on is that we are seeing key vacancies now being filled. And I think Alison and Laura emphasised that earlier. And I don't think we should underestimate the impact that that has on the ability to actually um, roll out now the, the services and the ways of working that's going to um, make the agency um, different to what it was before. So I think that's very important. We also talked about um, how we bring the transformation program to life for everybody within the agency. Um, and interestingly, the corporate plan was highlighted as something that's quite concrete, which we can then build um, targets and objectives around for everybody within the agency. So it flows down. And again, I suppose it's like the, you know, the, the tail in NASA where, you know, somebody cleaning the corridors, I helped put a man on the moon. This is what is my contribution and how we can use that uh, through the processes that are there. Um, I think i pull out a few things, the Gateway Zero Review, which was an independent review, I think, initiated by DHSC, 
for the transformation program um, did outline a few um, key actions. And one of them particularly pertinent to ADRC was the how do we articulate and share a clear visionary end state for the transformation program. And I think that how we communicate is very important going forward. Um, I would say also we've seen really good uh, progress in the services work of pilot really in established medicines. And that is, is providing a bit of a blueprint for, for other um, key services going forward. And I think getting more staff in will allow that to progress more quickly. We also had an update of the RMS programme. If you remember at the last board meeting, we reported on the joint meeting between ARAC um, and ODRC on the progress of RMS. Um, one of the things that highlighted to me particularly in the meeting was March 2024 is when Lotus Notes will shut down. Um, so that is a pretty hard stop. Um, and um, we need to um, have our minimal viable product of RMS in place operating well before then. And we targeted that for November 2023 um, so that that will give, give time. But I can't emphasize enough that March 2024 is a really important date for us. Um, we also reflected on our own effectiveness uh, of ODRC. And it's fair to say that our remit could be clearer um, it has grown somewhat with the transformation programme and we're working on that with Carly to ensure that we're, it's clear and I'm discussing with the chief officers um, what their expectations and understanding are of ADRC and that's been very valuable too. Okay, thank you Mandy and I think just to follow that last point up, I think the intention is to bring back revised terms of reference for the board committees to our March meeting uh, so there'll be an opportunity to look at all our board committees and the board itself in terms of terms of reference to bring all that work together. Also, just picking up on the point from the Gateway Review about the clarity of vision, uh, June, I'm just wondering whether that can be built into the corporate plan so that the corporate plan, if you like, clarifies the end state, I think was the term that Mandy used. Yeah, so, we, so we're all really clear we know where we're heading and the corporate plan is the mechanism to help us to get there. Absolutely, Chair. That's, that's the tool that, or the, the vehicle that we'll use. But in a sense, it needs to be articulated yeah. you know almost every day just to keep our focus on 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 where we're heading and uh, using the stories that are coming forward in different areas because in such a large organization there's different areas of rapid progress and understanding what the end stage is others that will need more um if you like you know reiteration to make it real so the golden thread the sweeping the steps to the man on the moon is there for everyone and uh, that's where ex exec team will focus. Yeah. But absolutely, the corporate plan. And really to say that our one agency leadership group has really picked up and gelled around the ideas. And that's what makes it so exciting that mm -hmm. it, it means the same for everyone, this Good. opportunity to look at the end stage. Great. That's excellent. OK, uh, Graham, I think you had a comment you wanted to Just make. to follow up, I was grateful for the clarity on gate zero because I wasn't I wasn't aware what it was and I wasn't sure if I should be. So. Is that something that the board should have sight of? It feels like it's a useful assurance document. Is that something that will come as part of reviewing transformation? I mean, or is it not necessary? I just don't know what it involves. Do you? was very keen that um, ODRC should look at it. Absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be more widely available because the recommendations are crystal clear. It was a really helpful methodology that the team brought a rigor and an external perspective and the half a dozen recommendations are absolutely spot on. So Chair, very happy yeah. for that to be done. Um, you need to see it through this lens and then to realise how the activities yeah. and the actions need to be focused. So we'll action that. Because yeah. I think it was actually conducted through the Independent Programme Authority, which is a civil service organisation that looks at all major programmes across government. And so they've got a really defined methodology and, 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 and a real strong rigour to everything that they look at. So I think actually it would be a benefit in sharing that report to the board, actually. So we can maybe take that as an action, please, Natalie. Thank you. OK, any other thoughts or comments? Excellent. OK, well, that's that's fine. Thank you very much for that, Mandy, and, and to also the work of your committee. And uh, we look forward to looking at the terms of reference at the next meeting as well. So excellent.
So we move on to our third of our board uh, assurance committees, and that's patient safety and engagement. Uh, Mandy, you're the chair. It's not Mandy. Mercy, you're the chair of that particular committee. Uh, you can assume we've read your report on page number 52, but any points you want to bring to the board's attention? Um, just to highlight the main areas that we, we looked at was the, the, the publishing of signals on um, um, adverse effects, suspected adverse effects. Um, and risk benefit communications. I would say we had a really good discussion. I mean, we had fewer topics, but we were able to deep dive quite quite well on these. Um, and um, it, it's always kind of the pros and cons of, of both these subjects that it was really useful to, to air in committee and I'll and I'll ask my colleagues to comment if they, they want to. Um, the the issue on publishing signals is is roundabout the concerns that patients and the public might have in publishing too early uh, when there's no real kind of uh, evidence of, of links to adverse uh, effects. And I think the committee, um, you know, rigorously looked at the, the best way of doing this. And, and at the same time, we want to be accountable and transparent as much as possible. So um, trying to do a pilot uh, in an area where we can actually pick up kind of um, signals at a stage that there might be an indication that this is linked to kind of medical uh, medicines and devices it's a good I think learning opportunity mm. for us uh, and to and to give it a go and we were uh, very supportive of that but to do it in a cautious way we were also uh, very um, aware about the impact on um, staff and um, on people who are very busy anyway um, but uh, we we thought um, moving the agency to becoming more transparent as much as possible, and and I think really treating um, the public um, to to the fact that they can assess you know kind of evidence um, in in its its full capacity, and when there's uncertainty, which kind of brings us on to the second subject, which was really about communicating. Uh, of benefits and risk as, as well. Um, and so this was um, a subject that I'm, I'm quite keen on really, on how do we, um, you know, kind of educate the public and, and, and figure out their ideas about how do you balance risk benefit when there is uncertainty, there's always uncertainty in, in um, kind of uh, medicines and devices. Nothing in life is 100% certain. Um, so how do we um, engage them in those kind of communicating risk benefits of, of um, things? So, um, uh, and, and I think it's highlighted really uh, for, for people that it's really uh, an important way of trying to engage people in the process of, of how we do that. Um, and it's a, a subject that PSEC has, has been uh, raising for a number of years. So I was really pleased in how far we've actually got in, in putting on these, um, these kind of uh, workshop, workshops and things. Um, the only other general thing that I would say is that we are working on our um, work program for, for the rest of the year. There, um, we're mature enough now, we've been going for about a couple of years, um, in having uh, subjects referred back to us and looking at progress. Um, and I think one of the things that I want to do uh, as a committee is review the impact we have yeah. as a committee and look at the assurance that we can give the board. Um, and so it's really good, we're now into a cycle of re-looking at um, areas that are coming back to us. So we can actually say, well, you know, the recommendations we we made, what impact did they have over time? And how can we make it better, really, and, yep. and hone that? So that's all I wanted to say. I don't know if any other members of the committee would like to comment. Okay. Um, Alison, is there anything else as Chief Safety Officer you just want to add to that? Yeah, so in terms of the signal, publishing the signals, to, first of all, to emphasise, this is part of a package of measures. Yes. So we talked earlier about the integrated drug analysis prints mm. that have gone on the yellow card system in at the end of December and actually had some stats the board may be interested in. In the first two or three weeks, we had 646 hits, visits onto that site with a big peak of interest mm. just shortly after they were released, but continuing use. So that's nice to see. Um, so this is a, um, a new initiative where we want to provide um, information, additional information on 
what we would call validated signals. So more mm -hmm. signals that we want to take further that are subject to usually a benefit risk evaluation that we take to our pharmacovigilance um, committee, our expert advisory committee for consideration, and then provide a short synopsis for uh, the general public to see what yeah. that work is, you know, and, and it's important to realize that not all those signals will result in regulatory action, but it's reassuring to see the extent of analysis and assessment it has done on, on each and every signal, and then to realize, well, to provide information that actually the, the committee is content, no regulatory action is needed at this stage, but continued monitoring of those areas of concern. So yeah. we're working um, since the since the endorsement by the committee, we're working to put that into plan. Excellent. In and, and although it doesn't come through completely clearly, mm. just, just to be really explicit, the Pharmacovigilance Expert Advisory Group is not an MHRA uh, internal staff, they're yes, independent, independent experts committee. within the field of medicine. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, I, as with some of our other independent expert committees. So again, I think that's a really useful balance. So we've got our internal expertise, but we're also using external expertise to, to balance this and to help to make the right decisions. So excellent. Okay, thank you for that. Um, colleagues, any other questions or comments on this report? Met Paul? I mean, it's, it's very pleasing, very encouraging. And I, I think you're doing this anyway. It's just ensuring diversity that we, we think very diversely about what diversity is. Um, so it's the, the patients who have fallen out of school and you know, struggling to understand things, making sure we're reaching them. And not surprisingly, it's something that we raise at our committee all the time um, to get reassurance of that. But we're always, um, I'm always interested to kind of open that up and for us to, to I suppose, um, also question ourselves about, you know, what we mean by diversity and, and inclusion. So thank you, Paul. Great. Uh, June, you want to make a comment? Well, thank you. And it's a really helpful and constructive report. We're mentioning in parallel the consultation with health professionals, asking health professionals how you like to know about emerging risks, whether it's validated signals or new advice on managing risk. And I wondered if um, we could ask Rachel, are we getting a good response to that? Is it an inclusive response? And are there any parts of healthcare professionals, we know how busy the NHS is, that we need to reach out to more? Yeah, thank you. So we're about uh, 12 weeks through a 16-week uh, um, consultation where we're asking particularly healthcare professionals um, how they receive and would like to receive our uh, risk communications and safety information. So we've had about 600 responses to um, a survey so far. Um, an analysis has started on that. We've also started running uh, some one-to-one -one interviews and some focus groups, and those will all be brought together into analysis after the uh, consultation closes at the end of January. The area that I'm particularly keen that we hear more from is actually GPs. Um, we've had a good response from a number of health uh, professional groups, but uh, I think it would be good to have more GP responses. That's a particular area we're um, looking to target more. Okay, and you're sat next to a GP who also wanted to ask a question. So, Junaid. <laughs> No, thank you very much. <clears throat> Apologies. It was a build actually on, on my question was going to be a build on I think what Rachel was talking about re regarding the communication of, of risk is quite a complicated dialogue. Yeah. One thing is it's about communicating it to the health professional and the health professional then communicating it to the public or indeed the public understanding. And there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. And, and typically the misinformation is on social media. The robust information is on our website. And Maybe there's something for us to think about around, is our website actually the place where patients and public go? And is it easily accessible, easily understood? And if we think about health literacy in its widest form, and we think about inclusion, how do we make the information easy to understand, knowing that actually there's a lot of misinformation out yeah. there, be that about vaccines or otherwise that we need to contend to. Um, and each of our healthcare professionals are very heterogeneous. What you need for a salary GP might be different from a locum GP, which might be different to a pharmacist, which might be different to a nurse, and then all the parameters in between. Then people also go to A&E for information. Yeah. So how do we almost create a stereo surround sound around actually what digital engagement might look like in this space and consistency of simple messages 
that might enable broader safety actions to take place by patients public and the wider healthcare professional society. So there's one thing about pushing it. I think there's something else about truly understanding the understanding of that information and then how that's recommunicated out to others in a very, very short time span. Mm -hmm. I mean, often it's a minute, 90 seconds that we have to communicate this information. Um, but people are leveraging WhatsApp and social media a lot more than necessarily going to a website. And we should probably right. be just be conscientious and cognizant of that too. Yeah, right. So just building on that, is that is that something that uh, you, know, you and the communications team would start to explore in terms of other ways of helping to get some of our key, robust, reliable messaging out there? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think as we move to develop the risk communication strategy, um, those are absolutely the things uh, we would want to consider. Um, I think the other thing I would say to build on your comments, Junaid, are that I think how we work with partners across the system is really important. And um, that includes uh, media outlets, social media outlets, um, as well as perhaps some of the more traditional partners. So we will build all of that in and, you know, look forward to a, a full discussion once we've uh, completed the yeah. consultation and done the analysis of the responses. Yeah, I think we've got I think there's we've, a real opportunity here for yeah, step change. Yeah, I think we're planning to have a risk communications item at a future board meeting. Um, so I think that will be the time to maybe pick that one up. Maybe just a quick follow on. I mean, I think others, so CQC often checks when they come for a practice visit. How are you looking at MHRA safety alerts? And do you have a mechanism for cascade? Um, doctors and others have to go through appraisal and revalidation and quality improvement exercises. Is are there things that we could do to nudge them and say, actually, wouldn't it be interesting if you did a, mm -hmm. I mean, we do reviews on Valparate all the time, but link that into a safety signal and alert and you link that into other activities. So we're embedding change yeah. and then also embedding quality improvement on the back of it. That then there's other value that others are gaining from the information being disseminated and linking it into perhaps other regulators and other enablers to drive safer healthcare throughout the nation. Yeah. That's back to continued collaboration with other other regulators in the space, I think. So, uh, Graham, did you want to come back in on that? It's sort of related, but um, I mean, a lot of the things, the signals we discuss around safety are in pregnancy, and I just wonder what the engagement with midwives in particular has been around and, and how, how that's progressed as part of your, your sort of survey of our attitudes. Rachel, is it? Yeah, certainly midwives are one of the target groups. Okay. So I, th I think I think there's, there's, it's work in progress, Graham. So I don't think there's going to be a specific answer beyond that. And, and Raj, final comment. Thank you. It's sort of building on 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 what Janet said. I think at some point, Chair, it'll be good for the board to understand because we've started the journey on what. And I think from a PSEC perspective, in a year, we've really made a huge amount of progress. I sit in PSEC, so I, I see it. Um, so we start on the what some somehow yeah. in terms of transparency, how we're going. The real focus now, uh, perhaps next, is on the who and the how. We need to prioritize on the who because you can't reach out to the entire community of healthcare providers. So knowing what we know, pregnancy registry, you know, group is still. So we prioritize on the who, and then we prioritize on the how. If you bring the three together, the what, the who, and the how, I think our progress will be much more tangible yeah. and we can track it. Okay, that's helpful. And, and June, final, final word from you? Um, one of our initiatives, bearing in mind that it's not just misinformation, it's information that's actually provided by other information providers that's different, led to the creation of an information in pregnancy consortium. And it's that kind of model where different data sets are interpreted differently for quite legitimate reasons that can lead to a very uncomfortable path for a health professional and a patient. So we're working hard because it's not just what we put out but it's that space that others occupy. And I really think it will come back in our next board discussion. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, Mercy, I think you stimulated a very interesting uh, discussion there. So thank you very much for that and also the work of your committee. So I suggest that we note your assurance report with thanks. That leads us on to the last of the substantive items, uh, which is uh, how will the assurance and governance framework of the MHRA continue to be improved? So that's page number 55 of the board pack. And Carly McGurry is our Director of Governance. Uh, you can assume we've read the paper, but are there any particular points you'd like to draw to the board's attention? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Yes, it's quite a long paper setting out a, a variety of work, so I won't, uh, I won't take up too much time. Um, obviously, the, the paper captures the work that we've completed in the transition to the newly uh, staffed and operational governance office as part of the, the wider transformation. Uh, it's, it also sets out the considerable work 
uh, ahead and the priorities for the coming year for the government's office. Uh, and as I just looked back on the paper once it had been submitted, uh, it just stood out to me the sheer breadth of, of that work that's uh, ahead of us, which touches on almost every aspect of our, of our governance and thus of the work that the agency is doing uh, to increase our controls, to better manage our risk uh, and ensure that we really are set to deliver optimally uh, on those public health outcomes. I think the thing that's really going to be critical, and it's come up a couple of times in, in discussion already today, uh, is ensuring that those key deliverables are really well understood and embraced right across the organisation in order for them to be effective. So that means we need to continue to make the links with the culture action plan, with the people, uh, people strategy that we've been talking about. We need to make sure that these activities are prioritised by the leadership cadre so that we start to create that virtuous cycle. Uh, it connects to some of the points that you were making, Paul, on the back of the ARAC report around how we embed better risk management across the piece. Uh, I think it also plays a part in some of the recommendations in the Gateway Zero uh, report where we, we have structures. Everything is in place, but it's not yet operating effectively. So how do we build into that ever continuous improvement? I think that's the, the key challenge underlining all of the others. Great. OK, well, thank you very much for a really comprehensive paper, Carly. And I think it's good to look back and see the progress that we have made, uh, but also then set out the challenge of what we've still got to do. So I think that's uh, that's clear. So, colleagues, are there any particular questions that anyone would like to raise on this particular topic? Oh, I'm seeing a stunned silence. Oh, that means people are either very happy or they're very unhappy. But I'm, I'm going to see Mr. Former, if that's OK. Yeah. So there's nothing else anyone wants to add. So, so are, are we clear then that this has articulated the right um, risks and actually the right priorities for Carly and her team to work on? Because if we don't say anything now, this is what Carly is going to do. Yeah. I think what's also helpful, Carly, is you know with staffing up your team. Would you like to maybe just say a little bit, bit more about the governance team and, and, and actually what that uh, incorporates? Yes, happy to. Um, the governance office breaks down into to three teams. Uh, one team headed by Natalie, which is the support for the board and the executive office uh, and for uh, June's office and, and Stephen. Um, never a dull moment, I think, in terms of all of the work that that uh, encompasses. We then have our governance risk and assurance team, which is where we've really brought together all of the functions that were previously spread across the agency. Uh, so we have risk, we have whistleblowing, we have fraud, we have um, quality assurance. Uh, and what we're really trying to do there is beyond just bringing those things together, really seek out where we can get more value from, from having those together. So we have had a relatively unconnected programme of audits under our quality assurance banner, uh, and then our internal audits working with GIIA colleagues. So how do we start to cross pollinate those and just use those a bit more intelligently and uh, effectively? Uh, and obviously there's a huge amount there uh, in relation to, to ARAC and, and risk, very close working with, with finance colleagues uh, and, and many others. Uh, and then the other um, element that makes up the governance office is the committee services team, which is the support for all of our expert advisory bodies. We've moved that into governance office to create a little bit more independence between the uh, uh, assessors in the operational areas who are driving things to committee for consideration and the team that supports them. Uh, they're picking up a number of Cumberledge um, recommendations uh, as well as contributing to some of the service redesign that, that colleagues are driving forward. So a vast range of, of activities, um, but as I say, onus on on us to work with everyone to make sure that that's really embraced and embedded right within the organization it's not activities that we do in isolation on our own yeah and i've always thought that good governance links really closely with organizational culture so organizational culture is almost the informal this is how we do things and this is the way we want to behave and and, and feel but actually the governance is the way of keeping us safe keeping it uh, you know really clear in terms of responsibilities and actually, that's why the terms of reference, the delegated authorities and all those components are really important. So, yes, they're, they're not necessarily the interesting read, but they're really, really fundamental to the way that we operate. And it keeps the organisation safe so we can help to keep patients safe. And that's the way I always think about it, I'll be honest. Um, I did have one question, if no one else has got one, and that's uh, um, about the framework agreement. 
we've been talking about this for some time, Carly. And I might, you might want to actually pass this to Catherine, but I'll let you decide that uh, in terms of when are we going to get this finally approved with the Department of Health? I think it manifested into a much bigger piece of work uh, than, than us and, and our partners in DHSC were expecting. I think the previous one had been delayed from being updated yep. as we were going through some, some fairly substantial changes internally and externally. Uh, I think that probably made it a bigger piece of work to do then to really bring yeah. it bang up to date. Uh, we did finalise that work before Christmas uh, in agreement with DHSC. Every last uh, T was crossed and I was dotted from our perspective. Uh, and it's my understanding that it's now with Treasury for formal clearance. It's been through legal clearance uh, between our respective teams and it's with Treasury. I believe Treasury uh, promise a return within around a month. We will see what we get. Okay. I, th I think just maybe I will, I will bring Catherine in if that's okay, J just in terms of maybe just to outline why the framework agreement is so important, because actually effectively it's our contract with the department, I believe, but maybe you want to sort of uh, give a little more colour to why the framework agreement is important. So it, you're right, it, it sets out what is the remit of the agency, what's the department's responsibilities to the agency, and how the two organisations will work together. It references key documents like managing public money um, and all being well is the sort of document we agonise over, argue about every detail, and then we put it on the shelf and forget about it because actually the organisations are working in accordance with it and all is well. But if, if things get more challenging, then it's there for us to refer to and remind ourselves, have either organisation drifted away from where we should be about what should be happening? And yeah. how we should be engaging with each other and working together. Yeah, and that and that relationship is really important because at the end of the day, the MHRA is an executive agency of the Department of Health and Social Care. So we can't pretend that we're completely, uh, you know, independent, can do whatever we want. You know, we have to obviously, uh, you know, fulfil our statutory responsibilities uh, and they're laid out really clearly in terms of what's expected of the agency. And that's why it's important. So hopefully uh, we'll get that before the end of the financial year. That's two months. That that would uh, that would be very helpful, and collectively we'll engage with Treasury to try and ensure that that's the yeah. case. But as Catherine says, we have the relationships in yeah. place. We we look after the sponsor relationship with DHSC. So hopefully it, it has a chance to get relatively dusty because we're doing it in practice yeah. every day. That's great. Okay, and June, just finally, anything you want to add as Chief Executive Officer and also the Accounting Officer of the agency when it comes to governance? I think. Um, very much welcome where we are, but the clarity, more importantly, of the priorities that now need to be addressed. And I know um, there's been a lot of work done, particularly at the executive, about <laughs> delegated authorities. We need to see those in place and uh, working well for everyone. No, it's, it's a, a really good stock take and the clarity gives us a clear plan going forward. Thank you. OK, so if the board is content, um, I'd like to suggest that we approve this document. Can everyone agree with that? So thank you, Carly, for you and your team. Um, uh, keep helping to keep us safe, but uh, more importantly, you know, we'll get all the, uh, you know, the due details sorted out. So thank you for that. And we can note that um, as approved. So that brings us to the end of the substantive items uh, on today's agenda. And that moves us on to the final item, which is about what questions the members of the public have. Um, and, and as I said, right in my early introduction, um, the purpose of this uh, is this is a board meeting held in public. It is not a public meeting. So, you know, we will only be taking questions today from uh, that are related to the papers in today's agenda. Um, so I can say that we have received seven pre-submitted written questions from members of the public, but none of them were directly related to today's papers. So they will receive a written reply outside of the meeting. Um, Rachel, as our Director of Communications, I know you've been monitoring the chat function. Can I just ask if there are any questions on the chat function that we need to consider? Yeah, there's uh, one specific question on the chat function that relates to the uh, topics that you've discussed on the agenda this morning. Okay, uh, so would you like to read that out and then we'll see if we can answer that. Sure. So the question um, was, how does the MHRA integrate yellow card reported data with communication messages? Okay, maybe can I maybe come to Alison first, and maybe uh, you know maybe back to you, Rachel. Actually, to be fair, as the director of communications, but from a safety perspective, 
Yeah, so, so it's a complex picture that actually. So um, obviously yellow card data underpins and drives all of our benefit risk yeah. assessments and they then directly lead to regulatory actions and that then leads on to our communications. So that's one way. Um, and obviously, uh, if, if the, the member of the public who asked that question was present at our board in November, they would have heard a comprehensive um, uh, presentation yep. from our Deputy Director of Patient Safety Monitoring, setting out the new enhancements that we're making to Safety Connect. And I would refer the questioner to, to that presentation, but just to set out some new enhancements in there. So for example, conditional logic, the use of conditional logic to guide questions that we might be asking reporters who, uh, uh, who are uh, reporting on a specific product. We're also adding more functionality to our news and information functions through that yellow card reporting function and members of the public can follow particular products that are of particular interest to them and that we will then push safety information to them if they have registered for that product. Um, and also we're looking to see how we might be able to integrate our messaging into um, more third party systems. So for example, the NHS app, and that obviously requires work with non MHRA members and other organizations. So that obviously is it takes a little bit more time, but that's another avenue we're looking at. Uh, how can we engage mm. more and bring more messaging to the public? OK, so, so so your team very much think about the decision and what needs to be communicated. Uh, Rachel, is there anything else you want to add in terms of the how uh, we, that we then take those messages and then publish them into the public domain? Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to stress the really close partnership between Alison's team and my team. Actually, there's a lot of uh, very integrated working on um, a whole range of safety issues. So we are always in discussion with Alison's team about um, the safety signals that are coming through and the best ways of communicating those. And likewise, if we're picking up things from a communication standpoint, feeding those through to Alison's uh, area. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So just for clarity, there are no other questions that were raised in the chat function that are related to the papers on today's agenda. That's correct. Okay. And also just as a reminder to members of the public, uh, any you know, the board has not seen uh, during this meeting any of the chat function comments that have been made, uh, and they will not receive a, a direct response if they were not related to the agenda today. Um, what I can say, though, is if people do have any specific questions they want to raise, they can be raised directly to our Customer Experience Centre. Um, so thank you for that. So I think that brings a, a close to the board business, but there's a couple of other things I just wanted to uh, to mention before we close, if that's okay. I think it would be remiss of us, not as a board, uh, just to mark the death of Professor Sir Michael Rawlings. Uh, Mike was um, you know, my predecessor as the chair of the MHRA. Uh, he also had a long and distinguished career with the uh, with National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, uh, was their founding chair. And I know Mercy and others have uh, worked with him uh, on, on, on that board too. And he was obviously he was a big part of the Committee of Safety of Medicines. So he had probably the best part of a 30 year involvement uh, with this agency uh, and made a massive, massive contribution and therefore completely deserved the knighthoods that uh, he, uh, he, he received as a result of, of, of that service to public health. So I think we should record uh, our sort of uh, our thanks uh, to, uh, to Mike uh, for all of his, his incredible work for the agency. Also, I think we should formally record our condolences to his family, uh, his three surviving daughters in particular. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And uh, certainly we're hoping that we'll be able to be represented either at the funeral or at the memorial service, uh, because that feels completely appropriate. But I think I just didn't want to let the moment pass without recognizing the huge contribution of Professor Sir Michael Rawlings. Also, I just wanted to uh, you know, make a sort of a, a formal thank you as well, uh, if that's okay, to our interim chief finance officer, uh, John Taylor. Uh, John, you uh, you joined the agency you know, just over four months ago. Um, you came in to, uh, you know, to fill an immediate gap that we had in our leadership team. So thank you very much for your support um, uh, during, during that time. The plan was always for this to be an interim appointment. So uh, you know, we appreciate the way you, you, you helped us out over that. Uh, and, and also pleased to announce uh, in a, on a more positive frame, um, you know, the appointment of Rose Braithwaite uh, as our substantive chief financial officer. And Rose is 
Uh, it's an internal promotion from within the agency. She's currently the Deputy Director of Finance. So I think it's really nice to see internal development. We talked about people's strategy and we've talked about recruitment, but let's not forget about developing good people that we have within our agency. And so from the 1st of February, uh, Rose will be our substantive Chief Financial Officer and will therefore be a, a, the next board meeting. So, John, thank you very much for your support. And again, I think we should record that in the, in the minutes as well. Thank you, Natalie. So that brings us, I think, more or less to a close. Um, before we leave, uh, I'd just like to remind everybody watching online uh, that the purpose of the MHRA is clearly to protect and to improve public health and patient health. We'll continue to do that by enabling scientific innovation, uh, by accelerating access to new, innovative and safe products, and also continuing to strengthen and look at ways uh, of strengthening our patient safety, our surveillance, and also our reporting systems, as we've been talking about today. So with that as the, uh, the final thought, uh, I'd like to close the meeting. Uh, wish you all a very good day, and thank you for your time today. Goodbye. <laughs>